Let me ask you about China policy. Uh, recently, there have been announcements of new restrictions on Chinese uh, companies relating to cloud computing. The Chinese are now beginning to uh, make, put restrictions in place uh, on critical materials relating to semiconductors. When I travel around the world, the sense I get is people are wondering, where is this going? Is this a ratchet where the United States will keep doing things like this? The Chinese will start responding and this goes on? Or do you think there's a kind of stable point here where US-China relations can be, as you have often said, competitive, but also, when necessary, cooperative? The answer is, I think there's a stable point. But look, if you don't mind my saying, just before we went on air, we talked about things are changing around the world. China is in flux right now as well. China has enormous potential capacity, but enormous problems as well. And, uh, and so uh, there's two things that I have tried to do in terms of our China policy. And by the way, I have met person to person with Xi Jinping more than any other world leader. 68 hours alone, he and I with an interpreter, back when I was vice president all the way through, because as you remember, it was clear he was going to be president and there was, uh, it wasn't appropriate for the president of the United States, Barack Obama, to be traveling the world with him. But I traveled 17,000 miles with him when he was vice president in China. And so we, we understand each other, I think, fairly well, number one. Number two, everything's changing. You know, you've heard me say it before, the world's at an inflection point. No matter what was happening, China is in a different place right now. Internally, internally, I'll give you an example. He often says to me, he, not often, he is on two occasions, call me and say, why am I criticizing what's going on in, with, uh, in Western China and slave labor, et cetera? And I said, remember you told me that for China to be able to be secure, it needs to have one leader, a united China from Taiwan to the Tibetan Plateau, and that's when China has always done well, going all the way back to the time when we had emperors. And I said, uh, and so for me not to talk about, and you told me for you not to talk about unity of China, it would be, you wouldn't be able to lead. I said, well, you, the United States is the most unique nation in the world. We are organized based on an idea. And I, for real, and I only idea, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal, et cetera. We've never lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it. And for me, for American presidents to remain silent on slave labor would be totally inconsistent. And so I think what I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm sorry to go on so long, is that I think there is a way to resolve, to establish a working relationship with China that benefits them and us. And the last thing I'll tell you on this is, I also called him after he had that meeting with, uh, with uh, the Russians with about you know, this new relationship, et cetera. And I said, this is not a threat, this is an observation. I said, since Russia went into Ukraine, 600 American corporations have pulled out of Russia. And you've told me that your economy depends on investment from Europe and the United States. And be careful, be careful. And so he- What did he say? He listened and he didn't, he didn't argue. And if you notice, he has not gone full bore in on Russia. He, is, he, he talks about you know, nuclear war would be a, a disaster. They, you know, there is such a thing as security that's needed anyway. So I, I, I think there's a way we can work through this. And that's why I've spent so much time beefing up. I think if I told you three years ago, which I was, had written about in my, my notes, that I was going to get Japan deeply involved, have them change their defense budget, have them work with, with not that I've done it, but them work with South Korea, work something out. We're going to put together the Quad which is India, Australia, the United States, and Japan. I got a call from him on that. He said, why are you doing that? I said, we're not doing that to surround you. We're doing that to maintain uh, stability in the Indian Ocean and, and in the South China Sea. 
because we believe the rules of the road about what constitutes international airspace, what constitutes international space in the water, should be maintained. And uh, so I, I just think it's going to take a little time. But, and where it goes depends a lot on what he's able to do internally in terms of his economy. Um, do you think he wants to replace, he wants China to replace the United States as the leading power, the defining oh, power? Oh, yeah, I think he system? does. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident he wants to have the largest economy in the world and have a, uh, the largest military capacity in the world. Rewrite the rules of the international order? I think so. Not all of them, but he says, he pointed out to me, he said, we weren't there when those rules were written about international airspace and, and so on. And, uh, but I don't think he wants, he's looking for war, conflict, expansion of territory. And he, look, I, I sometimes say to my colleagues, I've spent over 180 hours talking with my NATO colleagues and European colleagues in person or on Zoom. I, I, I say to them, do you know anybody, any world leader who would trade places with Xi Jinping? Okay, I'll trade, I'll take their problems, you take mine. I don't know anybody would, because it's not that he, he's a bad guy or a good guy. The, the, the circumstances are enormously complicated. For example, you know, the, uh, the whole notion of, uh, um, you know, the, this new ring road that's going to put around, he's going to invest in other nations. Well, it's ended up producing dead and a noose, you know. These countries are in real trouble. Uh, and so, but it requires us to be more responsible. The West, I've been pushing very hard to get our European colleagues to invest in infrastructure in Africa, in South America, in to generate the kind of growth that they should have and could have, because we're the ones that caused the environmental problems. We clear cut everything. We, and now we're telling them, no, everybody slow up. But I, I guess what I'm saying is I think there are positive answers to the dilemmas that exist without worrying about whether or not China is going to rule the world.